Should you wait to buy the new 9800X 3D? In this video, we are going to find out. My name is Matt, I'm a former rocket scientist, and my goal is to help you make the right component choices and put them together the right way every single time. In the Is It Worth It series, we've been helping you make the right choice by showing you just how much you can expect to increase performance with a drop-in upgrade. In this video, our focus will be on predicting the performance of the highly anticipated AMD Ryzen 7 9800X 3D. In addition to showing you benchmarks across 14 titles, I will also show you how I was able to predict the performance of an unreleased CPU. And if you stick around, I will share with you my pro tips for how to extract max performance from any AMD Ryzen CPU, something you will definitely not want to miss. It's really not rocket science, so before the main event gets started, let's jump straight into how I was able to predict the performance of the 9800X3D. The Ryzen 7 9800X3D is one of the most highly anticipated CPU releases in recent memory. This is primarily due to the amazing gaming performance of its predecessors, the 5800X3D and 7800X3D. The 7800X3D is still so popular that it's constantly sold out online at retailers such as Amazon and Newegg. AMD launched the new 9000 series CPUs in August 2024, however, they only launched the non-X3D variants. Unfortunately, this launch did not go well, with poor configuration choices made by AMD, combined with a general lack of reviewer technical competence, leading to poor day one reviews. However, this launch does offer an opportunity to predict the performance of the upcoming 9800X3D chip with some degree of confidence. To make any prediction, you have to start with defining some assumptions to cover the unknowns. Given that we have real data for the 7700X, 7800X3D and 9700X, there is only one fundamental assumption that needs to be made in order to make an accurate prediction. This assumption is that the configuration for the 9800X3D remains similar to that of the 7800X3D. If we look at the 7800X3D, this means that not only would the chip be 8 cores with 16 threads, but it also means that the L3 cache would remain the same at 96 megabytes. There have been recent rumors is suggesting that the clock speeds for the 9800X3D may see a bump, so if true, that would likely improve synthetic benchmarks, but it wouldn't likely result in a meaningful performance increase in games. The fundamental technical approach that I'm taking is to assume that the generation to generation performance improvement going from the 7700X to the 9700X will remain the same for the 7800X3D to the 9800X3D. Given that these are all 8 core 16 thread CPUs, it's reasonable to assume that it will. However, due to the way the 9700X was configured out of the box, it's not quite that simple. The 9700X was configured by AMD with a surprisingly low default TDP of 65 watts, which is much lower than the 105 watts for the 7700X. As I showed in my recent 9700X video, this low TDP has a large negative impact on the performance of the 9700X. So in order to make an accurate prediction, I first had to remove this constraint and optimize the 7700X and 9700X using the exact same tweaks. I decided to use DDR5 6000 CL30 RAM and I applied the following tweaks to both chips. I turned Expo on, I undervolted each CPU with a negative 30 all-core curve offset, I increased the CPU power limits and I set an 80 degree Celsius thermal limit, I increased the max CPU boost clock by plus 100 and I tightened the memory subtimings. To make sure that both chips were stable with these tweaks enabled, I ran Cinebench R24 and Kahu. I also checked the ADA64 memory benchmark to make sure that the memory bandwidth was not being impacted. I then ran a set of benchmarks for the optimized chips that consisted of six synthetic and professional workloads together with eight popular games. As you can see from these results, the 9700X offers a large boost in performance over the 7700X, with an approximately 13% increase in both professional and gaming benchmarks. This is a significant generation to generation improvement and is more aligned with what I would have expected to see in the day one reviews. AMD clearly did not configure the 9700X well, so hopefully they do a better job with the 9800X3D. To predict the performance of the 9800X3D, we first need to benchmark the 7800X3D. The test system being used to run the benchmarks is my AMD AM5 open bench table with the following components. For the motherboard, we have the Gigabyte X670E Aorus Master. For RAM, we have Corsair Dominator Platinum RGB 32GB of DDR5 6000 at CL30. For the GPU, we have an ASUS ROG Strix GeForce RTX 4090 OC Edition. For the CPU cooler, we have an EVGA CLCX 360mm AIO. For storage, we have 2TB SK Hynix Platinum P41 NVMe Gen 4 M.2 SSD. And for the PSU, we have an ASUS ROG Thor 1200W Platinum 2 power supply. Affiliate links for all of these components are listed in the description below. All testing was performed with the RTX 4090 at default clocks. I used the same DDR5 6000 CL30 RAM for the 7800X3D that I used for the 7700X and 9700X, and I applied the exact same tweaks that were outlined earlier in 
in the video. In order to thoroughly test the CPUs, I ran the benchmarks at different gain settings in addition to different resolutions. To place maximum load on each CPU, I tested at 1080p with low settings, which should allow me to extract max performance from each chip. To create a more balanced CPU GPU load, I tested at 1440p with medium settings. And to see if each CPU had an impact on GPU performance, I tested at 4K with ultra settings. These resolution setting combinations align well with typical gamer selections. With 1440p medium settings reflecting what most online first person shooter gamers would likely use to achieve maximum frame rates. Whereas 4K ultra settings reflect what most single player gamers would do with a high end CPU GPU combination to extract maximum quality. With the performance prediction ready to go, let's check the benchmarks to see what the 9800X3D will be capable of. As you can see from the benchmarks, the 9800X3D is anticipated to perform extremely well relative to the current king of gaming, the 7800X3D. To provide a robust foundation for this prediction, I spent some time optimizing the 7700X, 9700X, and 7800X3D. So a question that I'm sure many of you are asking is, how do you unlock the performance of your AMD Ryzen CPU? As from my previous videos on the new 9000 series chips, there are a few important tweaks that you should consider making in order to unlock the true potential of any AMD CPU. The first is to undervolt your CPU with a negative all-core curve offset. This can be done directly in BIOS using the curve optimizer option or in Windows using Ryzen Master. You can watch my How to Undervolt a Ryzen 7 7800X3D video to learn how. For single CCD CPUs, I recommend setting an all-core negative curve offset. And for dual-core CCD CPUs, I recommend setting a per CCD negative curve offset. This is a tweak that is heavily dependent on silicon quality. So I recommend starting at a lower value for each CCD, say a negative 10 CO, and then checking your stability with a CPU benchmarking tool like Cinebench or OCCT. This tweak is applicable to all AMD Ryzen CPUs and will likely give you your largest increase in performance, so it's one that I highly recommend. In addition to turning Expo or DOCP on in BIOS, you should also consider adjusting your memory sub-timings. You can watch someone like Buildzoid on actually hardcore overclocking to learn how to do this manually, but most motherboards now come with automatic memory overclocking options that usually do a decent job. For the Gigabyte X670E Aorus Master, there is an option called XMP Expo high bandwidth support that when enabled tightens the memory sub timings beyond XMP or Expo. In addition, a sub timing tweak that helps boost performance and reduce system latency is to increase the TREF or DRAM refresh interval to 65535. This will work on any CPU and is a common tweak used by pros to help extract max performance from a system. These tweaks are applicable to all AMD Ryzen CPUs. However, I wouldn't bother adjusting the sub timings if you have an X3D chip because the performance impact will be relatively small. If you do decide to make these tweaks, I would highly recommend running a memory stability tool like Kahu just to make sure your system is fully stable. If you want to extract max performance from your Ryzen CPU, then it's also important to expand the default power limits. You can do this multiple ways, but an easy way to do this on the Gigabyte X670E Aorus Master that I used in this video is to change the PBO limits option to motherboard, which significantly increases the power limits over default values. The only issue with doing this is that your CPU package temps will now routinely go above 9 
90 degrees Celsius under heavy load. So in order to keep your temperatures in check, I recommend adding a platform thermal throttle limit. I typically recommend using 80 degrees Celsius for Ryzen CPUs with one CCD and 85 degrees Celsius for dual CCDs. This will reduce your performance slightly, but it will help prevent excessive and potentially damaging sustained boost behavior. To take full advantage of higher power limits, you should also consider increasing the max CPU boost clock and infinity fabric frequency. I've found boost clocks of around plus 100 hertz tend to work reasonably well for most chips that I've tested. However, this is a tweak that is highly silicon dependent, so don't be surprised if you run into stability issues. For the infinity fabric frequency, which is the clock speed of the interconnect between the CPU cores and main memory, the approach is a little bit different. If I'm using higher speed RAM, such as DDR5 6400, I typically try to run an infinity fabric frequency that is divisible. So for 6400, I would try to run 2133, which is 6400 divided by three. If you use DDR5 6000 RAM, then I typically stick with the default infinity fabric frequency of 2000 megahertz, which is 6000 divided by Three. That said, I recommend testing different options in BIOS to see which one offers the best performance. For my 9700X with a kit of DDR5 6400 RAM, I was able to run 2133 MHz stable, which is an increase of approximately 133 MHz over stock settings. This tweak is also silicon quality dependent, so if you're having stability issues when running a CPU intensive benchmark like Cinebench or OCCT, then I would simply leave both of these options at default values. There are a number of additional tweaks that you can make in Windows to help extract max performance from your system. The first is to go into control panel, click on hardware and sound, and then click on power options. You can select the high performance power plan to ensure that your CPU cores don't go to sleep while gaming. There may be situations where selecting the balance plan is better, but overall the high performance option will result in higher average performance. Another thing you should consider doing is turn memory integrity off. You can do this by going to Windows Security and selecting Device Security. Under Core Isolation, click on Core Isolation Details and make sure that memory integrity is turned off. And finally, if you have a dual CCD CPU, such as any Ryzen 9, then you should consider either shutting down CCD1 in BIOS or assigning priority to the CCD0 cores in Windows when you start a game. For a Ryzen 9 CPU, you can force a game to use the first CCD by pressing Control alt delete and then opening the Task Manager. Once in Task Manager, you need to find the game executable file, which for Total War Warhammer 3 is called warhammer3.exe, and right click on it. Then select Set Affinity. In the Processor Affinity window that pops up, you need to untick CPUs 31 down to CPU 16, which is CCD1, while leaving CPU 0 to CPU 15 ticked, which is CCD0. You can then run the game, and the game engine will only assign tasks to the selected processors, which now corresponds to the first CCD only. So in summary, the system tweaks that I recommend making to extract max performance from your AMD Ryzen CPU are 1. Undervolt with a negative all-core curve offset. 2. Use Expo DOCP, set TREF equal to 65535, and adjust the memory subtimings. 3. Increase the PBO limits and set a platform thermal throttle limit. 4. Increase the CPU boost clock and infinity fabric frequency. And 5. Set the power plan, turn memory integrity off, and assign core affinity. The impact of these tweaks on performance can be significant and is summarized in this table. When implemented together, the boosting performance can be over 10%, which is is impressive. One important point to emphasize is that the performance boost that you are able to achieve will be dependent upon silicon quality. There is no guarantee that your Ryzen CPU will be stable with all of these tweaks enabled. After each tweak, I would highly recommend running a CPU intensive benchmark like Cinebench or OCCT and running a memory stability tool like Kahu just to make sure your system is fully stable. If at any point you find that your CPU is not stable, then back off on that tweak and retest. This may take some time to get right, but the performance boost you achieve will make it all worthwhile. In this video, we predicted the performance of the highly anticipated Ryzen 7 9800X3D to see if it's worth waiting for. As you can see from the results, it was, not surprisingly, a clean sweep for the 9800X3D with 14 wins across 14 benchmarks. At 1080p low settings, the 9800X3D is predicted to offer a significant generation to generation boost in performance with an increase of around 13% in average FPS and around 9% in 1% lows. Given how decisive this FPS increases across eight games, 
Teams, in addition to the 15% boost in professional workloads such as Blender, it's relatively easy to recommend waiting for the 9800X3D based purely on performance. But what happens when we look at cost? If we look at the launch prices of the CPUs used in this estimate, we see that AMD chose to launch the 9700X at a $40 discount under the launch price of the 7700X. If we were to assume the same trend for the 9800X3D, then this would make its launch price around $400, US which I think is too low. If the 9800X3D is able to deliver an increase in performance of over 10% as predicted, and given the current high demand for the 7800X3D, I think a more realistic launch price for AMD would be around $449, US which would be the same price as the 7700X3D. So if you now convert that into gaming value or FPS per dollar at 1080p, then the 9800X3D would offer a significant increase in value over its predecessor. If, however, AMD decides to pull an Intel or Nvidia and launches this chip at a premium of $499, then it would essentially offer no increase in value over the 7800X3D. So let's hope they don't do that. So should you wait to buy the new Ryzen 7 9800X3D? If you're building a new gaming system, I would, based on this prediction and a rumored release date of late October, recommend waiting for the launch of the 9800X3D. However, if the new Intel Core Ultra 9 285K processor doesn't offer an increase in performance over the 14900K, then AMD may decide to delay the 9800X3D launch. If that happens and you decide not to wait, then I would highly recommend buying a 9700X instead. When you optimize the performance of this chip, it becomes a gaming powerhouse, matched only by a 7800X3D. Before wrapping things up, I want to again emphasize that the performance shown in this video is a prediction only, to help you decide whether it's worth waiting for. This prediction is based on the fundamental assumption that the architecture doesn't significantly change from the 7800X3D, and that the generation to generation gains seen with the 9700X will be similar. There are rumors circulating that suggest the 9800X3D may get a boost in base boost frequency, which if true could provide a small increase in performance over the numbers shown. That said, I don't see any reason why these performance numbers would be lower than predicted. So the recommendations provided in this video should remain valid. Hopefully we don't have to wait too long to find out. Remember, it's not rocket science, it's Lego. My goal is to help you make the right component choices and put them together the right way every single time. Thank you for watching this video in the Is It Worth It Upgrade series. If you enjoyed today's video, please hit the like button and subscribe so you don't miss out on future episodes. And if you'd like to support the channel further, please also consider joining our new membership program, which I'm super excited about. Bye for now.